Welcome back to the Orthodox Universalist Channel. Today we're talking about question 7 from the Gospel Coalition's article entitled 12 Questions for the Would-Be Universalist, written by Michael McClymond in December of 2022. Now I've been real pumped about this one, so let's dive right in. TGC asks, what's the historic teaching on the final salvation in the major branches of Christendom? If Universalist teaching is correct, then it's remarkable it never found its way into any of the official documents, confessions, or creeds of the major Christian communities, Catholic, Orthodox, or Protestant. In Orthodoxy and Eastern Christianity generally, certain individuals were self-conscious Universalists, such as Gregory of Nyssa and Isaac of Nineveh, but they represented a minority group, and their Universalist views were merely a tolerated private opinion. Universalism was never admitted as official public teaching nor allowed to be preached from the pulpits of Catholic, Orthodox, or Protestant congregations. Moreover, the best-known early teacher of Universalism, Origen, was condemned by name at the Second Council of Constantinople in A.D. 553. Throughout history, this condemnation was taken as a rejection of Origen's teaching on universal salvation. So let me begin my response in what might seem like left field. I promise everything will tie together in the end. I've lived my entire life in the United States. My parents have lived their entire lives in the United States, as did their parents and their parents' parents. The U.S. is a young nation in historical terms, but it's still been around for a little under 250 years. A lot has happened in world history within that time frame. Napoleon rose and fell. An American Civil War was fought. Automobiles and airplanes were invented. Two world wars took place. We put a man on the moon. A lot can happen in 250 years, and a lot has happened. Now consider how much might happen in another 250 years. After 500 years, what will the U.S. look like? How will the political climate change? How will society change? Will the U.S. hold on to the values of its founders, or will it drift away? Regardless of what predictions we might make, I think we can all agree that 500 years is a long time. And it will definitely be enough time to define some of the things that the U.S. will be remembered for. Keeping in mind this vision of how long 500 years really is, let's turn our attention to the early church. TGC is particularly right when we think of this period when we consider their statement that universalist teaching never found its way into any of the official documents, confessions, or creeds of the major Christian communities. In fact, I think TGC is more right than they may have wanted to be. This is because universalism was not only never endorsed in any such statement, but it was also never condemned. Not once. This is worth thinking about. In the first 500 years of church history, a doctrine as dangerous as TGC makes universalism out to be isn't formally condemned. It's a historical fact that it was a known doctrine held by very influential figures, yet it isn't rejected by any councils or creeds. This is intriguing, but it gets even more interesting. As many already know, in 381 AD, the First Council of Constantinople took place. At this council, the Nicene Creed was affirmed, and additional language was added to the creed to dispel any doubts about the divinity and the work of the Holy Spirit. This council was attended by 150 bishops, including one church father named Gregory of Nyssa. He, along with his brother Basil the Great and Gregory Nazianzen, was one of the group we know today as the Cappadocian Fathers. These three men shaped much of the theology of the Eastern Church in their time and were well respected by their peers. Gregory Nazianzen and Basil the Great are perhaps more well known today, but we're discovering more and more that Gregory of Nyssa was a very prominent figure in the Church during his time. This is interesting because Nisa was a clear universalist. This fact is confirmed by well-respected Christian scholars Richard Bauckham, Morwenna Ludlow, and a host of others. But 
things get very interesting when we consider the status that Gregory of Nyssa held in the 4th century church. Consider the testimony of Catholic author and apologist Scott Hahn. In chapter 14 of his book, The Creed, he writes, Gregory of Nyssa, both brilliant and holy, was recognized by his contemporaries and peers as a man who most perfectly embodied the Council of Constantinople, the council that produced the creed we call Nicene and recite every Sunday. The emperor decreed that communion with Gregory was a necessary condition of orthodoxy. As the council ended, the fathers appointed Gregory to travel extensively, promoting the formulas of the creed in places where controversies had arisen. Such a testimony should at least make modern Christian thinkers think twice in their rapid disregard for the credibility of universalist thought. In the fourth century, not only was someone such as Gregory accepted, he was viewed as the standard of orthodoxy and appointed to the influential task of sharing the conclusions of the Council of Constantinople with the wider church. So while it's true that universalism was never widely endorsed in any creed or confession, it is equally true that universalists themselves were formally endorsed by those who authored such creeds and confessions. All this said, I will readily admit that universalism seems to be condemned by association with the Church Father Origen at the Second Council of Constantinople in 553. But let me draw your attention back to the idea we began with of just how long 500 years really is. That's how long it took for any formal declaration to arise that seems incompatible with universalism. For the first 500 years of church history, you could openly believe in Christian universalism. You could be appointed a bishop and even enjoy a prominent position of influence among believers. Why, if the doctrine of everlasting conscious torment is such a critical doctrine of Christian thought, did the Church Fathers fail to affirm its exclusivity and demand its affirmation for such a long time? But turning aside from our discussion of the creeds, let's take a brief look at TGC's statements regarding the condemnation of Origen specifically. They state, the best known early teacher of universalism, Origen, was condemned by name at the Second Council of Constantinople in A.D. 553. Throughout history, this condemnation was taken as a rejection of Origen's teaching on universal salvation. Some might disagree, but I believe this claim is completely legitimate. But we need more context. Origen lived from the late 2nd century until the mid-3rd century. He was a prolific writer, respected teacher, and most definitely a universalist. While Origen definitely seems to go too far at times in his allegorical interpretations of scripture, he was widely admired by his contemporaries and peers, and his works were studied closely by teachers and scholars for hundreds of years after his death, and they still are today. But in 527, over 270 years after Origen's death, Emperor Justinian came to the throne in the Eastern Roman Empire. A controversial but undeniably effective ruler, Justinian sought to restore the glory of the Roman Empire and to unite the whole church, East and West, under the same standards of orthodoxy. In both of these efforts, he was determined to do anything to accomplish his goals, whatever the cost. Consider the extent of his efforts. In 532, Justinian was facing pressure from his political opponents and was at risk of losing power. In response, he ordered the mass slaughter of over 30,000 of his own unarmed civilians. Later, in 551, Justinian issued an edict in support of the Chalcedonian faith, so named after the Council of Chalcedon that was held in 451. He then ordered that a council should meet to confirm his edict, but the Pope at the time, Pope Vigilius, didn't want to come. 
For this reason, the Pope was effectively excommunicated and then imprisoned by Justinian in Constantinople. After over seven years in captivity, the Pope gave in to Justinian's demands, affirmed his edict, and only then was he allowed to travel home. But he would die before he would arrive. I briefly mention these details about Justinian because we need to recognize that the Second Council of Constantinople, the council at which universalism is said to have been condemned, was a context in which personal conviction and persuasive arguments were constantly overshadowed by the very real threat of being thrown in prison or likely even killed. Justinian didn't like Origen, and he ordered his books burned in 543. If we're honest with ourselves, we have to recognize that the bishops that agreed to condemn Origen would have known well that to cross Justinian would likely lead to their similar demise. So was universalism formally condemned in the 6th century? For all intents and purposes, the answer is yeah. But was the air clear and the setting right so that the evidence for universalism could be fairly considered? Hardly. So what can we conclude? Just this, that for over 500 years, universalism was widely accepted and was never once rejected in any formal creed or confession. On the contrary, we see universalists such as Gregory of Nyssa being supported and endorsed by those who formed perhaps the greatest creed we have today. And it would take an emperor who demonstrated a willful disregard for human life and freedom to ever see universalism officially condemned. Thanks for hanging out with me as we discussed another question from the Gospel Coalition's article, 12 Questions for the Would-Be Universalist. Join me next time as we discuss questions 8 and 9. Like and subscribe if you like the video, maybe even share it. And thanks for watching the Orthodox Universalist channel.